Good Friday morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, the last hurrah. We have finally reached Labor Day weekend summer swan song. Mm -hmm. It's capping off what has been a nightmare travel season for many airline passengers. We've, of course, got your forecast and your weekend outlook on those highways and skyways for those of you, the millions of you heading out the door this morning. The soul of the nation, a blistering primetime speech from President Biden in Philadelphia. He took aim not only at his predecessor, but at the former president's supporter, so-called MAGA Republicans. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. More from the president's fiery address to the American public, plus the latest on that high stakes back and forth over whether a special master should review those seized Mar-a-Lago documents. A crucial snapshot of the American labor market this morning, the latest reading of the economy's temperature as we await a critical decision from the Federal Reserve on another possible interest rate hike. We've got August job numbers coming up. And we are going to begin this hour with the Labor Day getaway. Millions of Americans are taking that last big trip of the summer. Yeah, while most Americans will travel by car, the airlines are under the microscope after millions of passengers struggled through a summer of delays and cancellations. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello got an exclusive look behind the scenes with the FAA as they try to manage this weekend surge. So we have about 100 million people traveling this extended Labor Day weekend. Of course, the vast majority going by road. About 12 and a half million are going to be flying, two and a half million every day. And so this is the chance for the airlines to prove that they have upped their game after a series of really terrible months earlier this summer. The airlines have improved. Meanwhile, the vast majority of Americans hitting the roads and they're leaving right about now. It's a busy holiday weekend camping off a chaotic summer for millions traveling across the country. A third of Americans expected to take to the roads and skies this Labor Day weekend. Most will be driving, finally getting some good news at the pump. Gas now averaging 3.82 a gallon, down 40 cents in a month. But millions will also be going through airports after a summer of travel misery. We just want to check in with uh, New York Tracon one more time, reference Newark. At the FAA Command Center in Virginia, they're in high gear, tracking every plane moving across the country, coordinating commercial flights, private planes, rescue, and military operations. Now, after a summer of travel misery for millions of passengers, FAA managers are focused on keeping the airspace moving through this weekend and into the fall, especially in Florida. Florida, where air traffic control centers were understaffed and unprepared for the surge in visitors this year. What lessons have you learned here at the FAA from the last six, eight months or so? We have to make sure we have the right people in the right place. Uh, and we've done that this year with making sure that controllers are now uh, added to the to Jacksonville staffing. That passenger flood into Florida expected to continue through the winter and next spring. The busiest travel day so far this year, May 19th, nearly 51,000 flights. Right now, they're averaging about 47,000 or so. The biggest potential disruptor this weekend, as always, the weather. FAA meteorologist Roland Nunez. These are where the disturbances are, and they're actually moving across. This uh, one in particular caused going across Oklahoma and went over towards uh, the Florida area. <laughs> Meanwhile, at 12 of the country's busiest airports, Atlanta to Chicago, Detroit to LAX, the nation's biggest pilots union continues an off-duty picket, not a strike. They're in contract talks, and they want more money and an end to the record overtime they've worked as airlines have struggled with a shortage of pilots. They have tried to put schedules back in place that are pre-pandemic level flying, but they don't have the pilots and flight crews trained to do so. Delta says the union's goal is to gain leverage at the negotiating table. Again, about 100 million or more people traveling, about a third of the country, believe it or not. A couple of tips. Uh, if you do plan to travel and if you're going to drive, try to leave early. Uh, in fact, they say they suggest leaving before 9 o'clock if you can. Uh, and that's if you're driving. If you're going to be coming back on Labor Day, leave before 4 p.m. or after 10 p.m. And then don't forget, program that GPS to avoid the construction or the delays or the accidents, because that really can save you considerable time. It's something that I always forget when I start driving. I know, right? You. It does actually help. Tom Costello, thank you so much. So let's get a look at your Labor Day weekend forecast and your morning news now. Weather? Which, with Michelle Grossman, of course. Michelle, everybody wants to know, what can we expect this weekend?
Hi there, guys. Well, as we heard from that meteorologist, we are looking at some bumps in the road. We're also looking at heat waves. Let's start with today, and then we'll go through the weekend here, because today we'll start with the good news. Really nice conditions in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, New England. Temperatures really comfortable, 70s and 80s, low humidity, so a nice start to your holiday weekend there. We're watching the chance for strong storms in the Upper Great Lakes, the Upper Midwest, into the Central Plains, and we could see some pretty gusty winds, winds over 60 miles per hour, also some hail. Unfortunately, across the South, we're seeing that stationary boundary just sort of parked there. We're going to see it parked there all throughout the weekend. So we're looking at flooding risk from Texas along the Gulf Coast into the state of Florida. And then, of course, the big story for this weekend is the record highs out west. We're looking at temperatures into the 90s and also the triple digits. That's going to last at least until Tuesday. At least alerts are in place until Tuesday. So those record highs continue on Saturday. So does the flood threat. But notice it expands. At least the rain expands into portions of the Ohio Valley, the Tennessee Valley, into the Southeast, the Carolinas also. But another winter in the Northeast, also New England. Temperatures still really comfortable, lots of sunshine before that changes on Sunday. Unfortunately, on Sunday, we start to expand that rain out east into the interior portions of the Northeast, also New England. Numerous storms throughout the Tennessee Valley. Texas looking at another flood threat as well. Hot and dry through the northern tier of the nation, the center of the nation as well. No heat relief in the southwest, in the northwest, the Intermountain West, and also uh, portions of Ca uh, California. Then this is Labor Day. Notice it's wet along the east coast, unfortunately, a rain risk stretching from New England into the northeast and mid-Atlantic. The southern storms continue as well from Texas to the Gulf Coast, the southeast as well. And we're looking at temperatures peaking on Labor Day in some portions of the West Coast. We're looking at temperatures into the hundreds, triple digits, so probably many spots uh, spending their Labor Days indoors in portions of the West. So let's take a look at the heat because 45 million people impacted from the Northwest into the Intermountain West. The Southwest are included too. Sacramento to Fresno, Los Angeles, San Diego, you are looking at temperatures climbing once again into the 90s, also into the triple digits. And it's all due to this uh, area of high pressure. It's a heat dome. It's anchored in place over the four corners. It's pumping in that hot air. And that's why we're not seeing these temperatures budge, because this high pressure is not budging. It's sort of closing off the door to any cooler air coming down from Canada. So we're seeing temperatures 10, 15, 20, even 30 degrees above average in some spots as we go throughout the next several days. And we're also going to increase that fire risk. So that's going to be a big concern with people barbecuing outside over the weekend. And we're going to see uh, the chance for heat illnesses, too, especially those who are vulnerable, the children, elderly, and also those who are immune compromised. So record shattering heat once again, temperatures into the 90s, into the hundreds, 108 in Vegas, 97 in Winslow. Same story tomorrow. We're looking at temperatures into the triple digits in Salt Lake City. And then it's the south. We're watching a very wet weekend. That stationary boundary bringing showers and storms, pockets of heavy rain. Could see the potential for some flash flooding, especially in portions of southern Texas. And that will continue throughout Sunday and Monday. Back to you guys. A right, lot to keep an eye on this weekend. Yes, yeah. especially mm -hmm. as people are wondering how they're going to spend their day off, indoors or outdoors. All yeah. right, Michelle, thank you so much. Now to President Biden's highly charged primetime address. Speaking in Philadelphia last night, the president called his predecessor, former President Donald Trump and Trump's followers, a threat to democracy. The fiery speech comes as Americans gear up for November's midterm elections. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has more. With Philadelphia's Independence Hall as a backdrop, President Biden last night warning American democracy is under assault by the forces of extremism led by his predecessor, Donald Trump. Too much of what's happening in our country today is not normal. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. The president said he was not talking about all Republicans, but while Biden regularly spoke about threats to democracy during the campaign, this speech marks a sharp new tone for him as president. He long avoided mentioning Mr. Trump by name, but has now escalated his fierce criticism against a military backdrop. There's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. The president only briefly referring to Democratic achievements while noting the fight over abortion rights. MAGA forces are determined to take this country backwards. Backwards to an America where there is no right to choose, no right to privacy, 
No right to contraception. No Protesters right to tried speech. to interrupt the president's speech. It. Empathy that fuels democracy. The president hitting back. Good manners is nothing they've ever suffered from. The fiery speech reflecting President Biden's growing concern about Trump allies continued denial of the 2020 election results. You can't love your country only when you win. Top Republican Kevin McCarthy accusing the president of dividing Americans. Joe Biden and the radical left in Washington are dismantling Americans' democracy before our very eyes. And former President Trump later responding on his social media site, calling the speech awkward and angry, adding, if he doesn't want to make America great again, then he certainly should not be representing the United States of America. Our thanks to Peter Alexander for that report. Coming up, a new warning from the UN's nuclear watchdog in Ukraine. Their sobering findings after inspecting Europe's largest nuclear power plant in the middle of a war zone after the break. NASA hopes the second time will be the charm when it tries to launch its Artemis rocket on a test flight to the moon tomorrow. Yeah, NASA officials say they are now targeting Saturday for the lunar mission after Monday's attempt was scrubbed due to a technical issue with the engine. Now, if tomorrow's test flight is called off, then hopefully third time is a charm. And the next possible date, NASA officials said they could give this a shot will be Monday, September 5th. That would be Labor Day. So for more, let's bring in Paul Sutter, an astrophysicist and author of Your Place in the Universe. Paul, good to have you with us. So engineers say they have fixed the problem with one of the rocket engines that forced the original launch to be scrubbed on Monday. Talk us through what the issue was and then what you're going to be watching for tomorrow. Yeah, as on Monday, as we were chilling down the engines to their operating temperature, uh, a check engine light came on, basically telling us that one of the engines was not chilling down. So we had to scrub the launch. It turns out it was just a faulty sensor. The engine was chilling down, uh, but the sensor was malfunctioning. So as soon as NASA engineers identified that it was a sensor issue, not a mechanical issue, we're all go for tomorrow. Now, just since we've started this show two years ago, we have covered a lot of liftoffs <laughs> together. It's been very fun, lots of special coverage here. But the important distinction there is that those are these private companies that have popped up since the last time humans were on the moon, SpaceX, Blue Origin, companies like that. What does this launch, putting humans back on the moon for the first time in nearly 50 years, mean for NASA and its standing among those private companies? Paul might have frozen there, oh. so. Oh, oh, well, we love talking about space, so we'll have to get him back. <laughs> I think we'll go ahead and move on, though, if we can't. Oh, we oh, got Paul we back. We got Paul back. Did Paul hear Can my hear question? Paul? Yeah. Oh, great, I, I go heard ahead. your question. <laughs> Okay, uh, one of the, the coolest parts about this developing space age is that it's not about competition, it's about cooperation. NASA is the one who is funding SpaceX and developing uh, the private mm -hmm. industry. Future Artemis missions will require SpaceX vehicles. And if NASA has a super heavy lift booster and SpaceX has a super heavy lift booster, great, we have two super heavy lift boosters to use to explore space together in these kinds of new New partnerships. So, Paul, real quickly, let's look to the future. One of the goals is to build a base camp on the surface of the moon. How would that work? So cool. Yes, uh, so we are trying to develop a sustainable presence on the moon, a space station actually on the lunar surface. And what it requires is a lot of launches. We need to bring a lot of material to the moon. We need to set up regular delivery systems so that we can have an installation on the moon, probably near the South Pole, uh, where there's a lot of water ice potentially on the surface uh, that can help sustain human presence and, and just a lot of work. <laughs> All right, Paul Sutter, getting to the moon, that's easy. Some technology here on Earth still a little yeah. bit challenging. Yeah, really. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with us through the communication issues there. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Yep. Now, in Ukraine, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency says the physical integrity of the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has been, quote, violated several times. The comments come after U.N. inspectors finally arrived at the facility yesterday. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman has the latest on the visit. 
The UN's nuclear watchdog says the world cannot tolerate more damage to Europe's largest nuclear power plant after inspectors finally got a first-hand look at damage from months of shelling. I have just completed a first tour of the key areas. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency inspecting the plant for five hours, then issuing this warning. It is obvious that, that the plant uh, and the physical integrity of the plant has been violated. Just hours earlier, the unprecedented mission to the Russian-held plant was threatened by intense shelling before and during the inspector's journey across the front lines. Fighting so fierce, a nuclear reactor was shut down, and the head of Zaporizhia's regional administration feared the mission would be called off. He says, in terms of intensity, this was one of the heaviest attacks. Both Ukraine and Russia blame each other for violence around the plant. In nearby Zaporizhia, residents fearing the worst, lining up for iodine tablets, instructed to take them within six hours if radiation leaks. Svetlana Groha has a seven-month-old baby. Do you worry that you might have to give iodine to your baby? She says yes, because I don't know how it will affect my child. At the nuclear plant, a handful of UN technical experts remain there tonight and will keep working there for several more days. Josh, thank you. Sticking with international news this morning, Mikhail Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, is said to be buried on Saturday, but he will not be given a state funeral. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freire joins us now with that and other headlines making news around the world this morning. Hey, Janice, good morning. Good morning. Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, will not attend the public ceremony for Mikhail Gorbachev in Moscow on Saturday. Gorbachev's perestroika policies uh, made him popular in the West, but not very popular at home. He will, however, be given a military honor guard. State television also showed Putin placing flowers by Gorbachev's coffin at the hospital where he died on Tuesday at the age of 91. Dramatic video from Argentina shows a man with a gun threatening the country's vice president, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. Now, she wasn't harmed, there were no shots fired, and the man was arrested, but one government official is calling it an assassination attempt. It happened outside her home in Buenos Aires. She's known as a divisive political figure, and she was twice the country's president. And a big debut in the Indian state of Gujarat, where three lion cubs are set to be introduced to the rest of the world. They were actually born May 30th, but have spent the last 90 days under close observation because their mother, named Vidusha, lost three of her four cubs that she gave birth to back in 2020. But this time, zoo officials say everything's good. The cubs are healthy. They're vaccinated. She's really watching out for them. And everybody else will get their first glimpse of those cubs today. Aww. And that's a look at what's happening in your world. Oh, they're cute. Yeah. <laughs> Janice, we just, we love when this segment ends on a happy animal story. <laughs> a happy story. animal story. Those are the it's best. It's the best way to do it. Janice, thanks so much. Officials in Texas are reporting a disturbing increase in migrant deaths at the southern border. The journey north is becoming more and more dangerous as severe weather continues to plague the south. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson takes a closer look. In Eagle Pass, Texas, rows of makeshift crosses mark the final resting place of unidentified migrants. The gravedigger here tells Telemundo more than he's ever buried before. Across the border, migration fell for the second month in a row in July, but crossings are still at an all-time high, with Border Patrol reporting more than 1.8 million apprehensions from October. October 2021 through July, more than double the 860,000 reported during the same time in 2019. As the number of people making the perilous journey increases, often battling unprecedented weather from sweltering heat to record rainfall and flooding, so too does the number who die. Among the bodies recovered, a five-year-old girl who was swept out of her mother's arms last month and drowned just across the border from El Paso. Es donde más triste se sienten tratando de auxiliar al, al, al de dos meses y, 
sabiendo que el hermanito de tres años falleció. And the morgues in those border towns are running out of space. The busiest I've ever been in my entire career. By this time last year, 196 migrants had died in Webb County. That number, now 218. The remains of the dead now overflowing into the morgue's parking lot, where five refrigerated trucks hold 260 bodies and growing by the day. A fate that advocates say isn't inevitable. Y es algo que no debería de estar pasando, no deberían de estar perdiendo sus vidas uh, si tuviéramos un sistema eficiente, o sea, y es algo que creo que muchos de nuestros líderes verdad no 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 comprenden and now there's a new challenge more and more migrants are coming from places like Peru Nicaragua and Colombia which don't have embassies near the border making it harder to identify and return those who die to their loved ones me da mucha, mucha tristeza porque no sabemos quién son estas personas Even as so many of the dead remain unidentified, still, the grave digger in Eagle Pass places a cross at the head of each body he buries, marking the loss of each life. Es que la mera verdad, nosotros no, nos, no sabemos exactamente qué es lo que pasa. Nosotros nomás nos encargamos nomás de sepultarlos, ¿me entiendes? Y ponerle la cruz que miras ahí. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News. Coming up, another consequence of the pandemic age, plummeting test scores in the nation's classrooms. Yeah, after the break, why educators are blaming COVID for widening the performance gap between some students. This is Morning News Now. Let's go now to Jackson, Mississippi, where the National Guard is on the ground this morning, offering some much-needed relief. Residents there have spent days without running water after flooding pushed the city's already strained system to its breaking point. Now they're bracing for a hot and steamy holiday weekend with no end to the crisis in sight. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky is in Jackson and he joins us now. Hey, Morgan, good morning. So we can get into the bigger infrastructure challenge in just a minute, but first just tell us what is being done to help these residents just get through the day, drink water, take a shower, cook food. Yeah, Savannah, it's something we take for granted. And yet 180,000 people here still can't trust the water coming out of their faucet. One of the ways officials say that they're trying to help those folks out is by establishing seven of these mega water distribution sites manned by about 600 National Guardsmen that have converged on Jackson. They're going to be remaining here for the foreseeable future, uh, giving out water to anyone who needs it. In the meantime, this aging plant uh, that was knocked offline by these record floods had a temporary pump installed yesterday that brought some of that water pressure back up, uh, which helped a lot of these folks, but it's still very unpredictable. Uh, and that's why as of right now, everyone's still being told that boil the water if you're planning on drinking it. And even if you're bathing in it or taking a shower, keep your mouth closed because it's still unsafe to drink. Savannah. Now, Morgan, President Biden last night said the federal government has already offered everything possible to Mississippi officials that it's now up to the governor to act. Give us a sense of the work going on right now to get the water running again. What's the status on that? Well, it's kind of a twofold problem. They are trying to restore the water pressure by installing that pump yesterday and fix some of the problems that were caused by that flooding. Uh, but once they do that and they restore the pressure for this city system, uh, they're still facing the incredible task of potentially re hauling the entire system, which could cost upwards of a billion dollars. That's according mm -hmm. to the mayor. Uh, as for the process on that and how it's going, uh, it's a day by day situation. Uh, we do know that as of right now, uh, their main focus is on just restoring the water pressure. Uh, they're going to have to tackle the bigger issue uh, down the road, because right now, uh, with this boil water notice for this community having been in place for the past month, uh, they are simply trying to get to some situation of normalcy and stability uh, before they can tackle that bigger issue. But as you mentioned, President Biden, having chatted with both the mayor and the governor here, has said that the, his administration is offering essentially anything and everything needed uh, to try to solve this problem. Savannah. Morgan, we also know FEMA's director is scheduled to arrive there today. What should we expect from that visit? Well, FEMA is here for the long haul. We do know that they'll be remaining on site for the foreseeable future. Of course, they're going to bring in additional federal resources. But uh, the director also made a point to say yesterday that they want to be able to reimburse for any equipment or materials 
uh, that were purchased or that will be purchased uh, to expedite in this recovery, uh, especially as it relates to getting that water plant back online. Uh, this record flooding that took place here over the weekend uh, left it in a state uh, that wasn't just um, hurting the equipment by damaging it, uh, but th there's a massive cleanup that also has to happen as well. Uh, FEMA is expected to help in that. And then, of course, uh, for these residents here uh, who may be facing uh, long-term situations where they can't trust the water, uh, they'd also be able to help in that regard. But I will tell you, it is striking to see FEMA arrive in a city that you look around, you're used to seeing them in a hurricane or a tornado mm -hmm. environment. Uh, and here we are with an underground disaster that uh, you mm -hmm. can't really see. Uh, and yet you have uh, the federal government here for an unknown amount of time uh, because nobody knows how long it's going to take to fix. Oh, that's a really good point, Morgan. You know, you think about this, it's a major U.S. city. This is right here at home and, and people being told not to open their mouth in the shower. Uh, how are people holding up? It's tough. A major city, a capital city here in Mississippi. And right now, for the people that we speak to, it's very interesting uh, because when you ask them how they're holding up as it relates to this plant failing, a lot of people will say life didn't really change that much mm. because they've been under a boil water notice for the past month. And then past that, there have been ongoing issues with this water system for years, if not decades. And unfortunately, and perhaps what's saddest of all is that a lot of the people we've spoken to here in Jackson have kind of accepted this as a way of life. And when I spoke to the mayor yesterday, he says that that has been a form of humiliation uh, for both the community and himself. And he's hopeful that this catastrophe that's happened is shining a light on the bigger problem and can hopefully get this community uh, to the, the standard uh, that it needs to have when it comes to clean drinking water. Absolutely. And Morgan, as you pointed out, not during some type of other extenuating disaster, just for everybody at home not in Jackson to think about if everything was just fine, you know, weather-wise, for you to feel like this was happening in your home, to have to boil your water every day, something they got to get figured out. Morgan Chesky, thank you so much. Now to some breaking economic data. Yeah, in just the last few minutes, we got the jobs report for August, which showed the U.S. economy added 315,000 jobs during the month. The unemployment rate inched higher to 3.7 percent. Here to help us understand all these numbers and what they mean for you, we are joined by CNBC Global Markets reporter Seema Modi and Investopedia's editor-in-chief Caleb Silver, along with Kristen Myers, editor-in-chief of TheBalance.com. Kristen, we're going to get to you in a moment, but first let's begin with Seema and with Caleb. Yeah, Seema, let's start with you, actually. So break down these numbers for us. Just generally, what are they showing? What does that number mean? So what it does show is the U.S. economy added 315,000 jobs in the month of August. That is below the number that we saw in July, where we added over 500,000 jobs. But it's still better than what Wall Street had expected. The estimate was for 300,000. Uh, the unemployment rate did tick up a little bit higher at 3.7 percent. Last month, we were at 3.5 percent. It certainly comes as some of the biggest names in business have been slashing jobs, primarily in the technology sector. Snap just this week shrinking its workforce by 20 percent as it looks to cut costs. A challenge many companies are facing, of course, as interest rates rise, interest rates rise and as inflation is still at that 40-year high. Now, the size of the labor force is below pre-pandemic level. That plays into what we're seeing the labor market right now as well at around 64 percent. Job openings, though, we know are still higher than expected. That's what we got in the JOLTS data later, earlier this week. And if you talk to recruiting firms, they will tell you employees still have that negotiating leverage. Plus, fewer people have been filing for jobless claims, which also tells us that Americans losing their jobs are quickly finding new ones. Right mm. now, pre-market action stocks are actually responding well to this. We are higher across the board before the market opens mm. at 9.30 a.m. So, Caleb, let's get your reaction to these numbers. It is pretty close to the estimate. Were there any surprises here that you're seeing so far? Not so far. We didn't see a lot of revisions either for the prior two months. If we saw a big revision for July, that would have told us the labor market wasn't as healthy, healthy as we thought it was. But we haven't seen those, at least not yet. This is a pretty solid number. And when you look at where the job gains are, they're in professional and business services, 68,000 jobs added there. They're in healthcare, 48,000 jobs added there. And retail, 44,000 jobs. We'd seen some layoffs in retail. So you're looking at, wage, at job gains in some of the sectors that pay a little bit better. We'd previously seen just 
just the gains in leisure and hospitality and in warehousing. Mm -hmm. Those jobs don't pay as well. These are good paying jobs and they keep getting added month after month. The labor market is still pretty healthy and that's something the Federal Reserve considers when it thinks about its next interest rate hikes coming up in September. That's exactly what I want to ask you about, Caleb. So this is one of those last things they're going to have to look at before this month's meeting. I mean, do you think these numbers will impact their rate hiking path? Is it still full steam ahead? What do you think will happen? Yeah, I think it's full steam ahead. They're seeing this and they're saying the labor market's okay. Retail spending and the consumer are holding up okay. We're going to continue to raise hikes. And we've heard some chatter from Fed presidents and governors this week. They want to see that Fed funds rate up over 4%. That's a big jump from where it is right now at 2.5%. So expect more rate hikes through the rest of the year, which will put pressure on the economy and the stock market. And Seema, you touched on this already, but what are we seeing so far with the pre-market reaction to these latest numbers? And what are we going to be watching for then with the markets as the day moves forward? Very interesting pre-market action here. Stocks are sharply higher. The Dow is implied open of 160 points. Yields are ticking a bit lower. We're at around 3.1, 3.2%. We had been bouncing around positive, negative ter territory ahead of today's job support. Uh, and yesterday, we did snap a four-day losing streak, uh, but we're still down on the week, of course, following those comments from Fed Chair Jerome Powell, who reiterated his objective of bringing inflation down. If that means, even if that means raising interest rates higher than expected, he will do just that. So this job support certainly plays into his decision uh, later this month, but the Fed does have another inflation report it will be keeping a close eye out which will come out in about a week so economists have been arguing that that report will be even more influential as they get ready for that next decision so caleb for the viewer at home right now hearing okay this was about what we expected interest rates might still go up what does somebody need to know what does this mean for the economy and people's pockets at home this morning yeah, they're going to have to expect that we're going to get higher rates, which means higher rates on your credit card eventually, continually higher rates on the 30-year fixed mortgage, new car loans. Everywhere we borrow money, those rates are going to tick a little bit higher. But it's not so aggressive right now where the Fed has to get even more dramatic than that three-quarter point rate hike they're probably going to do in three weeks here. So this is kind of what we expected, though not as extreme. Folks should expect just higher rates going forward and more pressure on the economy. But the labor market continues to remain strong. All right, Caleb and Seema, thank you both. Appreciate your analysis of this breaking news. We're going to keep talking about the Federal Reserve. It acknowledged earlier this week that recession is a risk that the country will face as it tries to tackle inflation. Yeah, in fact, some economists say it's inevitable and the worst is yet to come. Kristen Myers, editor-in-chief of TheBalance.com, joins us now. Kristen, good morning. So I think some people hear that. Maybe it's kind of confusing because we think we just heard maybe some good news there. We've added good-paying jobs and it was on track. What do you say here? Are the indicators pointing towards a deeper economic downturn than we initially thought and that is sort of something looming on the horizon? Yeah, this is a really good point. So what we did have today is a very strong jobs report. The numbers coming in fairly in line with economist expectations. But we do have to realize that the job growth that we are seeing right now is starting to slow down. The U.S. economy adding 528,000 jobs in July and now just 315,000 in August. And of course, we all keep hearing these headlines of major companies really starting to have layoffs. Wages are starting also to start to come down a little bit. That growth is also moderating. So what we're seeing right now is the U.S. economy still going strong, but starting to lose some steam. And of course, with the Federal Reserve probably deciding to give us that 75 basis point hike in just under three weeks, the chances of a recession is going to start to grow. So is a recession on the horizon? I think one is going to be in our future. How far away, however, still remains to be seen. So, Kristen, unemployment rates, those seem to be one of the key factors for the Fed's decision on interest rates. So let's take a look at the numbers. We know the unemployment rate last month, really, in July, was back to its pre-pandemic level, 3.5 percent. That was tied for the lowest since 1969. Now we've seen a slight uptick for August. 3.7 percent. Should we read much into that uptick there? And how much or how high of an unemployment rate would you expect for the Fed to tolerate before trying to do more to bring down inflation? Yeah, so it's not great that the unemployment number just ticked up a little bit slightly from that three and a half to 3.7 percent. Economists had expected that unemployment rate actually to remain unchanged in the month of August. However, it was pretty much going to be expected with the job growth starting to moderate. And again, all of the headlines about layoffs, that unemployment would probably start to creep upward. And again, this is something that is to be expected and that the Federal Reserve is actually expecting. 
Jay Powell came out and said it. Hey, economic pain is going to be coming. We're going to see some softening in the labor market. And this is exactly what he's talking about. So we are going to start to see those unemployment levels tick upward. Now, what the exact unemployment level uh, that the Federal Reserve will look at and say, hey, we need to slow down, that, of course, is a huge question mark. Only the policymakers over at the central bank know that. But as long as the labor market continues to be strong, they are going to continue to use that as a proxy for the strength of the U.S. economy. So if the labor market is strong, the U.S. economy is strong, and that means that it can withstand these raising mm. of those interest rates. Kristen, let's also talk about the housing market. There's this debate going on as to whether the U.S. housing market right now is in a recession or in a correction. Some definitions say that that's six months of straight decline in home sales. But again, walk us through what that would mean there, recession versus correction. What's the difference between those two? And what does somebody who's either looking to buy or sell need to know? Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they hear housing recession, they really start to freak out, especially because 10 years ago, a housing recession really precipitated the great recession that we saw. Really, what we are starting to see is that housing prices are starting to moderate. Home builders are saying, hey, we're not building as much and we're not feeling as optimistic. But here's what we do know for the housing market. And if you're someone that's waiting for those housing prices to crash, unfortunately, don't hold your breath. It's probably not going to happen. You are going to see some of those housing prices start to come down. And as the Federal Reserve raise those, raises those interest rates even more, those mortgage rates that we've already seen popping well over 5% are probably going to go even higher, yeah. which means that housing prices will probably start to come down. So if you're a little bit flexible and you really want to get into the housing market, this mm -hmm. is a really good time to start looking. All right, Kristen Myers, thank you so much for your analysis. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for your help on this breaking news. And coming up, an NBC News exclusive. Yeah, crucial welfare money in Mississippi redirected to pay former NFL quarterback Brett Favre for motivational speeches that he never ended up giving. Now the question remains, how did the money end up in the hands of Favre and others? We've got that report coming up next. Now to our ongoing series, The Fleecing of America. We have an investigation into a brazen welfare fraud scheme in Mississippi. State officials say it redirected millions in welfare grants meant for the state's neediest to those who were well-connected, among them former NFL star Brett Favre. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian has this story. You know, you have to make a choice whether you want to pay your light bill or whether you want to put food on the table. Tamara Edwards raised four children on her own in Mississippi, applying for welfare benefits just once for child care while she worked. Each year, Mississippi gets $86 million in welfare money from the federal government, though the state rejects 90 percent of those who apply, including Edwards. And when I reapplied, I was not able to be on it again, because they told me that they didn't have the fundings for it. But the state was dispersing millions more of its welfare dollars, just not to families that urgently needed it. In court documents and audit reports, the state alleges that the head of Mississippi's welfare agency squandered more than $70 million intended for children in poverty, instead using it as a private slush fund to benefit his family and friends. Tens of millions of dollars on items like hiring retired pro wrestlers, first class air travel, a horse ranch, and $5 million to build this women's volleyball facility at the University of Southern Mississippi. That building with ties to an NFL Hall of Famer. Brett Favre's daughter played volleyball at the university. Text messages obtained by Mississippi Today show Favre saying he helped secure government grant money for a new arena. And he personally was paid more than a million dollars to give three motivational speeches that never happened. Favre declined to talk to NBC News, but his attorney says he has been questioned by the FBI. Favre says he never knew it was welfare money and paid it back after demands by state officials. Favre still owes $228,000 in interest imposed by the state auditor. I wanted to at least collect the facts. Former U.S. Attorney Brad Pigott was hired by the state to find the money. How is Brett Favre getting money that's supposed to get kids out of poverty? It's a mystery to us. Here we had uh, tens of millions of dollars sent by the country to do the thing that we need done the most, and it was squandered. In July, he issued a subpoena to get more answers about that volleyball arena, including any communications between the university and former Governor Phil Bryant, whom Pigott says directed the spending. 
Bryant says he was unaware that welfare money was involved. What happened to you after you filed your subpoena? I was uh, terminated. The state welfare agency says they fired Pygott because the client and the lawyer were not on the same page. The investigation has only recently resumed. Welfare agency head John Davis was arrested and charged with bribery and conspiracy. He pled not guilty. The agency declined an interview, saying they are committed to rebuilding the trust of the citizens and making all future grant decisions by committee. So far, just $1.1 million has been recovered. We are real people. There's real people out there that really need that money. Ken Delanian, NBC News, Jackson, Mississippi. Now to those wildfires burning in California and the toll they are taking on the men and women battling them. As wildfire seasons get longer, the strain from the long hours of battling the flames is causing firefighters to suffer from PTSD. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson brings us the story of how these first responders are now asking for help. For Reva Duncan, becoming a wildland firefighter felt like a calling. I liked being able to see that what we were doing made a difference you know, immediately. But with over three decades on the job, it became challenging. Experts are saying climate change has made fire seasons longer and more intense. We used to go three, four years without having a big fire season that, you know, caught the attention of the media. And we started to seeing those that gap also closed. How did that impact you personally? It's physically and mentally demanding job. Her mental health taking a hit, especially as fire chief in Northern California, faced with death in a way she'd never seen before. We had three horrendous years of fatalities. We had two helicopter crashes, all the pilots died. We had um, a burnover fatality. A firefighter from Washington was killed on one of our fires, it was burned over. We had some non-line of duty deaths from a couple of our employees, and it took its toll on on me and a lot of my coworkers. The unmanaged stress manifesting in negative behavior. I was drinking a lot more, I was drinking and driving. I was angry, my temper, I just could not control my temper. I was really difficult to be around. Until she hit a breaking point. I had a panic attack and I hadn't had a panic attack and I was driving and that was pretty scary. And so that I think is what really got my attention. So I looked to find a trauma trained clinician. Reva was diagnosed with PTSD and she's not alone. And as these fires have gotten more intense, so too has the stress on the people fighting them. There was a 2019 survey polling about 2,600 wildland firefighters. Of that, about a third said they experienced some form of suicidal thinking, while about 40 percent said they had a colleague that died by suicide. Professional firefighters do have higher rates of traumatic mental health problems from such big episodes as huge wildfires. They will have higher rates of PTSD. Dr. David Eisenman of UCLA studies the effects of climate change on mental health. On the one hand, you have people who really do have clinical depression, but then there's the more subtle experiences that last sometimes a lifetime, a level of anxiety or sadness or despair that uh, doesn't quite meet, you know, doctor's definition, a psychiatrist's definition of a mental health problem, but still negatively affects people's lives. For Reva, therapy was a lifesaver. Now retired, she works as a peer supporter to help other firefighters work through their trauma, and it's helping her too. You're volunteering to help out mm -hmm. even after your, your career. Has it brought that love back for you? That's a great question. Yeah. I think it did bring that, that love back, but in a in a healthier way with better boundaries with that. I mean, the job is the job, it has its demands. But yeah, it definitely brought back the love, yeah. Our thanks to Steve for that report and more is being done to raise awareness of mental health for all first responders and mental health. Peer support programs like we just saw are available as well as a growing number of treatments, including talk therapy. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.